When planning a trip across the United States, most people will probably tell you that driving across the states is the best way to see the country, or maybe they fly to an airport and then rent a car to their final destination. When traveling to the US, most people need to learn there is another way to discover the country, traveling with Amtrak. And to be fair folks, I live in the United States for quite some time. And I've done all three ways of traveling mentioned above. I flew, drove across the land, and took Amtrak. Let me get this straight for you. There would be better ways between cities and Amtrak. Driving or flying would be faster, of course, but crossing the United States by train is far more enjoyable than driving or flying. I've done it many times and it always stays the same. Getting stuck in traffic or in the middle of seat between two fat people isn't cool. Oh, hell. Since the North American railway system was developed way before flying or driving became mainstream, Amtrak would take you to the wildest place in the US, where not even a road is built. Hi everybody and welcome to this new video. Today I will present to you the best Amtrak route to take if you're going to the United States. I've been on most long distance routes so far for my trip report, the only exception being the Lakeshore Limited and the Texas Eagle. But from what I've heard and seen, this route wouldn't have made this list. Before diving into the video, let me know your favorite Amtrak route in the comment section and why. I'm very curious to know. Also be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It's now time to talk about the sponsor of this week's video, AG1. So traveling can be exhausting, especially for your body. And if you are traveling a lot, as I do, AG1 is a perfect offer to keep an healthy lifestyle while traveling. I used to carry loads of fruits and nuts uh, to cover my daily needs for my body, and it was a lot to think about. Now with AG1, simply add a scoop or travel bag to this shaker, and it will cover all your nutrients gaps. It's made of 75 high quality ingredients, and adapts to any diet. And if there is one thing I love the most is how easy it is to adopt AG1. Traveling always shakes your habits. But drinking AG1 daily is not a problem. I always travel with my little shaker and the number of travel bags of AG1 I need for the length of my journey. I tried AG1 about a month ago and I can't live without it anymore. I recuperate way better after a workout when I'm home and I feel less tired when I'm traveling and I can be more focused for my work. To be fair, I didn't expect like a good taste uh, when I first drank AG1, but actually it was delicious and my favorite is mixing AG1 with some regular milk and when traveling, I use water. If you are interested with AG1, tap my link to get a one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D3, K2, and 5 travel packs for free with your first purchase. The first on the list will be the Cardinal between Chicago and New York. When Amtrak took over the passenger service of many railroads in the USA in 1971, they inherited of two trains, the New York Central James Wickham Railway and the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway CNO George Washington. Eventually, these two similar services were quickly merged in 1971 to form only one train, and it became the Railway in 1974. The Cardinal took its current name in 1977. The Cardinal was a state bird of all six states through which it ran. It's one of the rare long-distance trains uh, together with the Sunset Limited that does not run daily but three times a week. The Cardinal is also a rare train that duplicates two other long distance services the Lakeshore Limited between New York and Chicago, and the Capital Limited between Washington DC and Chicago. The Cardinal too, takes around 26 hours to link the two cities, and it's perfectly timed to run through the most scenic part of the route during daylight. Amtrak advertises route as the most scenic east of the Mississippi and they are 100% right about it. I took the Cardinal between Chicago and Washington DC. I didn't ride all the way up to New York. It was simply perfect. I had great time on board this little train. The Cardinal comprised only one engine, two coach cars, one cafe, and one sleeping car, and also one very weird dormitory luggage car, quite unique among the long distance fleet. The train leaves Chicago at 5.45 in the afternoon, so you will have plenty of time to enjoy the roommate and your dinner while cruising through the beautiful state of Indiana. Be careful, the Cardinal is the only one on this list that doesn't have traditional dining. Instead, it has flexible dining, and some sort of microwave food. It's not the best, it's okay-ish, but does the job. You will wake up in the state of West Virginia, in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains, and of course the gorgeous New River Gorge. It's definitely the highlight of the trip. If you can, ride the Cardinal during the fall and the famous leaf peeping season. 
The Cardinal runs through the most remote place of the eastern part of the United States during the day before entering Virginia's Rolling Horse Country. If you want to ride a train between the East Coast and Chicago, ride the Cardinal. It's an absolute gem of a little train. The Sunset Limited was introduced back in 1894 by the Southern Pacific Railroad and is the oldest continuously operating named train in the United States. Operated by Amtrak since 1971, it was extended to Florida in 1993 with through service between Los Angeles and Jacksonville and even Miami at some point, making the only Amtrak service connecting coast to coast. Unfortunately, the service was interrupted in 2005 due to some track damage uh, by the Hurricane Katrina. I would love to see that again one day if CSX wasn't a little prick to Amtrak. Like the Cardinal, the Sunset Limited only runs three times a week. Anyway, I rode the Sunset Limited going westbound from New Orleans to Los Angeles. The train departs at 9 in the morning from New Orleans and you will spend most of your day going through the beautiful swamps of Louisiana and Mississippi before arriving in the late afternoon in the great state of Texas. As we say out there, everything is bigger, bigger in Texas. You will leave the states of Texas almost 24 hours later. The size of the states is just massive. After falling asleep between Houston and San Antonio, you will wake up in the middle of the Texas desert and somehow waking up here feels magical. I have such strong memories of opening my room at a window shade and seeing this massive chunk of land on the horizon, then heading to the dining car and having breakfast. It was just magical. You would spend almost all day going through the most remote place of the southwest before arriving during the late afternoon in El Paso, Texas. Be sure to look on the left hand side of the train to see the Mexican border. The Sunset Limited is going right by it. Then you will enter the state of New Mexico and finally Arizona, where you might enjoy if the weather has great and incredible sunset. The arrival in California is scheduled for 5.35 in the morning, which is very early, but remember that the Sunset Limited is one of the least punctual trains of the long distance network. If you're lucky, you might see some of the marvel of California, such as the Salton Sea. Uh, before Los Angeles. And I did arrive on time in Los Angeles and to be fair, I did not enjoy waking up at 4.30 in the morning. Set Limited is equipped with superliner coaches, usually three sleepers, a dining car, an observatory car, sightseeing or lounge, and some coaches. For this trip, I made two separate booking to save some money and rode coach accommodation during the first day until Houston, and then I took a sleeper. I explained this trick in my trip report on YouTube if you are curious. Next one on the list is the mighty hot train, and that is the only train that made up to this list not because of the scenery, but primarily how unique and useful it is. The auto train is a motor rail service, operated daily by Amtrak between Lorton, Virginia, a small town a couple of miles south of Washington DC, and Sanford, Florida. This service is unique in North America, since it allows people to put their own car onto the train in some specially designed freight car ride comfortably on the train and wake up in Florida the following day. It saves the hassle of driving more than 12 hours on the busy Interstate 95. And of course you can take this train without a car, but with a car it's more fun. The auto train started as an independent passenger railroad founded by Andrew Garfield in 1971. The company was a huge success and I recommend you to watch this outstanding documentary by Peter Dibble. The company was a success but due to some financial issues and truly some bad luck, it has brutally ceased operation in 1991. Amtrak revived the service two years later in 1993 and it's one of the most profitable Amtrak routes. They have their own fleet of G Genesis engine and very special superliner. For example, you can find sleeping car with only bedroom on the top floor of the superliner. Only the auto train has this unique car. And the auto train is also the longest scheduled passenger train in the world. The train it consists is roughly three quarters of a mile, so which are around like 1.2 kilometers, and has regularly more than 50 coaches, 18 passenger cars, and more than 30 auto racks to carry the car. The train leaves at 5 p.m. from both terminals, checking open at 12:30 and close two hours before the departure. And I rode the train uh, from Virginia to Florida, and once on board, you will have a freshly cooked meal delivered to your roommate. 
Scenery wise, it's not the most exciting, but if you're riding the train in winter, it feels completely unreal to go from the cold weather of the northeast and waking up under the Floridian sun in flip flops. When I rode the Silver Meteor between New York and Miami, it was snowing in the northeast, and when I woke up in Florida the next day, it was sunny and warm. And this just happened overnight. This might happen with you on the auto train. During my journey, I remember falling asleep at the Virginia and North Carolina border and waking up in the middle of the forest, uh, somewhere between Florida and Georgia. It was just magical again. The, your sleeping car attendant would bring you your breakfast pre ordered the night before. Before you even noticed, you would be in Sanford under the sun of Florida. Once off the train, wait 45 ish minutes to get back to your car and then you're free to go anywhere. Even though this train is not the most scenic amongst the Amtrak system, it's still a very unique one. And to be fair, the schedule is very convenient. Precisely like the Silver Service, uh, Silver Star and Silver Meteor. In one night of sleep, you go from the northeast and wake up in Florida. How magical is this? The coastal light is probably the Amtrak route where you can see most of the different landscape in one trip. The coastal light has everything in one trip, from mountain to desert to massive cities, to seashores. This one also has an important spot in my heart because it was the very first train I rode in the US when I was 18 years old in 2015. I rode the Coast Starlight in coach between Oakland and Los Angeles. And this is thanks to this trip that I have a deep relationship with Amtrak. The Coast Starlight runs between Seattle and Los Angeles daily and connects the two cities in 35 hours along the West Coast. When Amtrak took over passenger service in 1971, they combined two previous existing trains of the Southern Pacific, the Coast Daylight and the Starlight, making the first train to connect all the West Coast. I have taken this train two times in my life, and although sleeping car available, I rode the route, the whole route in coach accommodation. The Starlight is a very popular route. The Starlights leave Seattle in the morning. Straight after Seattle, you can enjoy the Puget Sound, but now the trains take the Pond Defiance cut off. Nevertheless, the first part of the journey is an actual palette of what the Pacific Northwest has to offer. During the afternoon you would be in the heart of the Cascade mountain chain. It was for me one of my favorite moments on this train. I rode train in 2020 during the COVID and I remember chilling on the in the lounge with one old dude and we spent our afternoon talking about life, drinking beers and enjoying the wild nature of the Cascade mountain. It was just unforgettable. I remember falling asleep after Klamath Fall or in Oregon and waking up in the Bay Area, sipping my coffee in the lounge with the Bay Area in the background which is breathtaking. And if the weather is clear, you can see the Golden Gate Bridge and the building of downtown San Francisco. After leaving the Bay Area, you will head to some sort of desert-ish of Central California before heading out to the mountain again and toward the sea. During the afternoon, don't miss the horseshoe curve over Cuesta Pass right before San Luis Obispo. Once you leave San Luis Obispo, you will ride along the Pacific Ocean for several hours. Be sure to be on the right hand side of the train. The coast starlight will make its way by the evening into Los Angeles. Again, I'm very pleased with the scheduling, like the North East to Florida series. It's convenient enough for most travelers and it doesn't feel like you're spending too much time on the train. Be ready for the next two journey I'm going to present folks, because these two ones are known for two things, being, being long and highly stunning. To be honest with you folks, I was never particularly attracted by the Empire Builder and I never understood the hype of around this train. I was like, yeah great, you go across the rocket and then it's a great plane all the way to Chicago. And that was my initial thought before riding the train back in 2022 and since that day I realized I was 100% wrong. The Empire Builder was introduced in 1929 by the Great Western Railway, linking Seattle and Portland to Chicago. It inherited its name from its founder James Hill, who basically reorganized several, several falling railroads in the north to create the first privately funded transcontinental railroad. Since Amtrak took over operation in 1971, it has become Amtrak's busiest long distance service. When traveling long distance on Amtrak, I usually like to go westbound, but for this one, I went eastbound and I was glad I chose it. I went with some friends on this trip and the main goal was to discover Glacier National Park in Montana. The Empire Builder leaves at 4.55 in the afternoon which give you plenty of time to visit Seattle and enjoy some time in the beautiful King Street station. Don't be surprised if the train is short when pulling into the station. 
the other half of the train comes from Portland. Keep in mind that the side chair lounge is on the Portland section, so you won't have any lounge until later at night. The good thing is you will get the true dining experience on the first night, where the Portland passenger will get the lounge but the flexible dining. Once the train departs, it heads north toward Everett along the stunning Puget Sound. Once in Everett, you will head east, and that's the part I had absolutely no idea about it while I was planning the Empire Builder. We were going straight into the Gascon Mountain chain, and I have to say it was gorgeous. We were having an apéro with my friend, such an unforgettable moment after which we headed to the dining car and we had a delicious dinner. The dining car is one of the best things about traveling with Amtrak. Later during the night, your train would be coupled to the Portland section in Spokane, Washington. By the following day, you would wake up in the heart of the Rockies and just past your breakfast, the train enters the Glacier National Park. This is where our ride became even more enjoyable. We, with my friend, we got off at a train in West Glacier, Montana. And we stayed there for a couple of days for hiking. And it was such a delightful stop. And that's something I highly recommend if you want to try an Amtrak long distance journey. Making a stop during the trip is a good idea, especially if you're not used to staying more than a day in a train. If you want to keep up in the railroad theme, stay at the Isaac Wharton Inn. It's such a lovely place for rail fun. If you want to stay here, you have to get out Essex, Montana. And did you know that the Glacier National Park was created because of the great Reston Railway lobbying since the railroad wanted to attract customers into this remote area of the United States. They proposed and lobbied to create the National Park. The ride through Glacier National Park is just fantastic. Your train will climb the famous Marias Pass and finally hit the Continental Divide. Past this point, all the river you will see will flow into the Mississippi River and end up in the Gulf of Mexico. One of my favorite part of the trip was when we started to hit the Great Plains and we saw the Rockies fading away on the horizon. And now it's just a vast plan. You will fall asleep on the night of the second day in North Dakota. By the start of the third day, you will be in Wisconsin. And again, I didn't expect much from this area of the US. Yet again, it was beautiful with low and forests and lakes. By the end of the third day, you, you will arrive in the heart of Chicago, 45 hours after leaving Seattle. But the best remains to come. And this is my favorite Amtrak route so far. Mighty California Zephyr. Let's be honest, the name is just fantastic and quite badass. It's an exclusive invitation to an odyssey. And the Zephyr stands for a mountain wind. The California Zephyr was inaugurated in 1949 and was operated by several railroads. The Chicago, Burlington and Quincy Railroad, the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad and the Western Pacific. And unlike most trains mentioned above, it was discontinued of in March of 1970 about a year before the formation of Amtrak. And I won't go into too much detail because it's quite incompli complicated. Still, Amtrak used to run a Chicago to Bay Area train through different routes before finally reviving the original California Zephyr. Only in 1983, when the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad handed over their passenger service to Amtrak, Amtrak could finally use Denver and Rio Grande track west of Denver via the Moffat route. And I love this story and riding the California Zephyr has always been a dream uh, because of one thing. A stretch of this route is on the original transcontinental railroad that was complete in 1869. I've been passionate about this subject since I was a kid. It was a dream for me to ride this train. That's what I did for my 25th birthday. I bought myself a ticket between Chicago and San Francisco. Of course, this train is also marketed as the most scenic in the US. Like the Coast Starlight, you, you see almost everything the US has to offer. From the Great Plain to the Rockies to the desert of Utah and to finally the Bay Area. The Zephyr will be your prime choice if you want to see the most varied landscape. The train departs Chicago at 2 in the afternoon, giving you plenty of time to enjoy the Midwest beautiful fields, farms and barn. By 5 o'clock, you will cross the mighty Mississippi River before arriving in Burlington, Iowa. And I remember riding this train with my girlfriend while enjoying drinks and playing cards. We met this lovely British couple who became our friends for the journey. Even to this day, we are still in contact. That's the magic of Amtrak train. We are all stuck in the same train for several days. People are chatty and it's very easy to make friends, even if you are traveling solo. By the time you finish dinner, you will be arriving in Omaha in the state of Nebraska when the Transcontinental Railroad started its route out west. In the morning, you will wake up with the Rockies in sight. 
I remember opening my window blind of my roommate and seeing the Rockies in the background. It was just breathtaking. California Zephyr makes a rather long stop in Denver, Colorado for crew changing and refueling for about one hour. Anybody can stretch their leg and explore the nearby Union Station. And you should grab a coffee at the peak train in Union Station and enjoy downtown Denver. Don't miss the train though. Right after Denver, this is where our train is getting interesting. We are finally making our way through the Rockies. The first highlight will be the Big Ten Curve. A series of 10 consecutive curves and you will climb along the foothill of the Rockies. And on your right hand side, the Great Majestic Plain. You will soon enter the tunnel subdivision. A series of 33 tunnels. I can't tell you where to watch folks because it's scenic everywhere left, right, above. Then you will enter the famous Moffat Tunnel, named after David Moffat, the man behind this crazy project of creating a railroad through the Rockies. The Moffat Tunnel is 6.2 miles long and goes through the Continental Divide. That's also the highest point of the Amtrak system with an elevation of 9200 feet, 2800 meters, above the surface, above sea level. Once you pass the Moffat Tunnel, you will be in the heart of the Rockies until the night. You will go through several canyons, such as Gore Canyon or Gledgoon Canyon, all along the mighty Colorado River. And if you are riding the train in summer, you will be flashed. It's a known thing around here. As you approach Grand Junction, the landscape is slowly transitioning into the red rocks. And by the evening, you will be in the heart of the famous Book Cliff of Utah, desert landscape typical of the Old West. You will reach Salt Lake City during the night. It's a shame because the ride looks outstanding, but you need the train to be several hours late to see that. On the third day, you'll probably wake up in the desert of Nevada, right before entering another mountain chain, the Sierra Nevada. And this is where you finally ride on an original transcontinental railroad over the mighty Donner Pass. Going through the Sierra is also very impressive. And I remember we spotted the baby bear in the woods. A couple of hours later, you would finally meet the Pacific Ocean with the Bay Area and the city of San Francisco in the background. But be careful, you will arrive in Emeryville, not San Francisco. You have to book until San Francisco on Amtrak website, otherwise you can take the throughway shuttle bus. 53 hours after leaving Chicago, you're here, ready to enjoy California. The Zephyr 100% deserve its title of best Amtrak route by far. Like most Amtrak long distance trains, this train has three sleeping car, dining car, sightseer lounge, and some coach All this trip I've talked about in a video can be booked on the on a website of Amtrak. Prices vary a lot, and so my biggest suggestion would be to book as soon as possible. Trains have been fully booked for months ahead lately, especially sleeping cars. Other tips always bring food and drink, even though you're in sleeping car and food and drinks are included. A deck of cards and some games can be also fun. The best entertainment is still a good book. To read while riding on the side of your car. All right, folks, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Let me know your thought about my choice of route and be sure to uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, guys, and thanks to AG1 for sponsoring this video.